Okay, it's my great pleasure to welcome Louise Emmett, who I'm sure everybody knows um, from St Vincent's, and Louise will be speaking on restaging in metastatic cancer. Thank you, Louise. So thanks very much for inviting me to speak today and a shout out to uh, everyone from St Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, um, here today. Um, I'm talking about restaging in metastatic prostate cancer and I had a great family anecdote on clairvoyance but Michael tells me I'm not allowed to tell that. I'm just going to get straight on to business so I'm going to do that. And I also have to say that I, um, these are my disclosures. Uh, and I also have to say that I've, I think I've stolen someone else's topic, um, so I'm sorry about that, Sydney, um, a little bit as well, because I'm not going to just talk about restaging in metastatic prostate cancer. I also want to talk a little bit about high volume, low volume charted criteria today. So this is what we have at the moment for high volume, low volume uh, in, uh, in staging of metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer and also for treatment response. Um, in metastatic prostate cancer for systemic therapies. Because I have blind faith that PSMA PET is better. We actually can't persuade our oncologists with blind faith. We need good science and data to show them how we can move across from PSMA, from Moan scan to PSMA PET. Seems very obvious to us. If we have this PSMA PET and the bone scan both taken on the same day, we can tell total tumour volume, we can identify lesions, we're looking at tumour directly, we can look at lesions in bone, viscera or lymph nodes, and we get prognostic information on intensity. But we have to have criteria by which we can define that for our oncologists. We are starting to get some of this data. Uh, obviously we have level one evidence for uh, the superiority of a PSMA PET over CT and bone scan from the pro-PSMA study from Mike Hoffman and team. Um, and this NICE study has done a direct comparison um, between bone scan and PSMA PET across the cohort of prostate cancer. And what it found um, was that 57%, in this study, 57% of positive bone scan findings of staging bone scan were false positive. What that means for the patient is if we're using bone scan to identify metastatic disease, around half of them won't actually be metastatic disease and we're potentially um, denying these patients the possibility of definitive cure and these patients are going on to systemic therapies. So why are oncologists still cleaving to CT and bone scan for high volume, low volume um, assessment in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer? It's because of charted criteria. So charted criteria are they use to, to define how to intensify and de-intensify treatment. They use um, whether it, presence of visceral metastases on CT and also whether um, there are four or more bone scan of, uh, lesions on bone scan in bone to define high or low volume. It means that they can decide whether a patient needs docetaxel instead of just ARPI and ADT in the hormone sensitive setting. In the Stampede trial, it helped define improved overall survival in low volume metastatic disease with the addition of radiotherapy to the primary. So they use it every day for their patients. We don't yet have a criteria on PSMA PET to define high volume and low volume that is accepted and correlates to overall survival. This is what we need to work on. This work is um, starting. So this is the paper from Barbado et al, from Ken Herman's group in Essen that looked at total body quantitation and determined that charted criteria high volume was 40 mils of tumour on PSMA PET quantitation. But should we do it quantitatively? Should we have a visual criteria? We need to incorporate whether or not patients have visceral metastases and we also need to incorporate the CT findings on PSMA PET into any criteria that we develop. So the onus is on us. We need to develop a criteria that our oncologists can use every day that correlates to overall survival so we can make that bridge between CT bone scan and PSMA PET. So another thing that's really important when we're looking at um, using PSMA PET for assessment of systemic therapy is the impact um, of other treatments on the PSMA intensity. PSMA is a manipulable receptor, we know that. In the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, um, in patients who are starting on ADT, we know that about 80% of patients will lose their receptor activity 
PSMA receptor activity very quickly. So this is a prospective study from um, uh, in, in patients with metastatic hormone sensitive um, prostate cancer commencing on ADT. This is the PSMA PET prior to starting ADT. This is nine days after starting ADT. So if you're going to assess high volume, low volume disease on a PSMA PET, if they've already started on ADT in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, you need to be very wary of the fact that you're actually going to be missing disease and understaging the patient. Similarly, for treatment response in metastatic castrate resistant cancer, we need to be very careful. This is a patient from the same study. They had metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer about to start enzalutamide. So this is prior to commencing enzalutamide. You can see they've got metastatic disease in bone. After nine days of enzalutamide, you can see multiple new lesions. This is PSMA upregulation. It's not disease progression. So once again, any criteria that we develop for um, treatment response in metastatic prostate cancer has to take into account the timing of the systemic uh, treatment that the patients are on and need to be incorporated into the criteria. So the NCP trial is a trial that I hope many of you know. It's a randomised uh, phase two trial run at 15 centres across Australia of enzalutamide versus enzalutamide plus two or four doses of lutetium PSMA. One of the things I'm super excited about with um, NCP is that we're going to be able to look at the magnitude, um, frequency and significance of PSMA upregulation in these patients on um, a systemic ARPI because we've embedded baseline, day 15, day 92 and first progression PSMA PET in all patients um, in this study. We do have some preliminary data coming out between the, in all patients between baseline and day 15 to show that there's been upregulation of the PSMA receptor in about 70% of the patients on this study and we'll be presenting this data later this year and also doing a lot of work to correlate that to overall survival. What does it actually mean for these patients? So we need to develop treatment response criteria on PSMA PET. And in order to do that, we need to embed PSMA PET into prospective trials like we have with NCP. But there are some lessons to be learned. So this is a patient on the NCP study. This patient was on the enzalutamide alone arm. This is the baseline bone scan. This is the bone scan at three months. And you can see they've probably got a met in this uh, scapula there. It's still there but there are no new lesions to suggest that this patient has metastatic disease progression on PCWG3 criteria. This is the PSMA PET at the same time point that the bone scan was done. And you know, it's really quite different. So baseline, three months, this patient has multiple new lesions on PSMA PET, 100 new lesions on PSMA PET. We don't have a criteria yet for saying whether this is disease progression or not. So what happened to this patient is the clini clinician understandably said, looking at this scan, this patient has unequivocal progression. They took the patient off trial. They didn't do any confirmatory CT or bone scans. And this has impacted the NCP trial very significantly. We have a positive PSA PFS, but when you look at our RPFS, this actually crosses. This is the impact of embedding PSMA PET because we have 35 patients who were censored on the enzalutamide alone arm who had disease progression like that patient who got taken off trial without confirmation on CT and bone scan. So we need to ask pharma to start embedding uh, trials. We need to start, um, pharma to start embedding PSMA PET into trials, but we need to find a way to do that safely. In order to do that, we need to come up with some standardised criteria for treatment response on PSMA PET, for both for prospective trials and for clinical purposes. So what criteria do we have? Ken Herman and Stefano Fanti about four years ago came up with the PPP trial, the PSMA PET progression criteria, uh, which was very similar to the 2 plus 2 that they use for bone scan and um, PCWG3 criteria. So two new lesions classified as progression or an increase in size of greater than 30% also classified as progression. Or RECIP is lovely. So RECIP is a, um, a combination of quantitative change in volume and new lesions. And this was derived from a 124 bicenter study in patients who were undergoing lutetium PSMA therapy. They embedded a baseline and interim PSMA PET at 12 weeks. And using that and correlating it to overall survival, they defined RECIP criteria as an increase in total tumour volume of 20% plus new lesions as progressive disease, and a reduction in volume of greater than 30% as partial response. 
Doing that, they found that the overall survival between these patients was quite different. If these patients had progressive disease, their overall survival was eight months, versus if they had partial response, overall survival of 21.7 months. So encouraging, but difficult to do, uh, and perhaps difficult to implement clinically, and we really need to think about what criteria we want to use. While we're thinking about it, we also need to think about criteria for treatment response for SPECT. It's looking very, very nice on a number of studies now for um, early, early response biomarker um, to lutetia and PSMA. Um, so what we need to do is we need to develop guidelines. We need to develop guidelines that correlate to overall survival, that are easy to implement, that don't impact prospective trials, and that create bridges between what we have now, CT and bone scan, and um, and PSMA PET. So we've got a lot of work to do. We need to define optimal PSMA PET criteria for high volume, low volume disease in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer to guide treatment intensification decisions for our oncologists. They're not gonna move until we do. We need to develop standardized criteria for treatment response with PSMA PET. We need to do this in a dynamic and harmonized process and not impact current clinical trials, and that's quite difficult. And we need to look at really what we should incorporate in those criteria. Um, I think uh, it needs to have prognostic and pre predictive capability. Someone once said it should be developed as an imaging biomarker, and I think PSMA PET has so much capability for that. We need to look at volume. We need to look at intensity. We need to look at new lesions, and we need to decide if we're going to do that visually or quantitatively. Thank you.